Hi uh, friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Tech. My name is Alan. Before we begin today's episode, I have a special announcement to make. Uh, ben, I don't know if you guys have noticed, hasn't been in any of the recent videos, and that's because he's actually working on one of our other projects. So I'm a little bit overloaded right now. Um, you know, I do all the writing, all the research. Uh, I do all the CGI, that's what you see right here. This is not actually me, you're just hearing my voice. I don't look like this. And also, um, I do all the editing, and that takes me about 12 hours a day, seven days a week. And you know, I basically don't have any time to look over my business or do anything else I really need to be doing. Um, which is why me and Ben have decided that, hey, we want to hire an, uh, an editor to come in and help us with our channel. If you guys want to learn more about this opportunity, go to our Facebook channel. Uh, we have a video posted there, including more details about how you can apply for this job. Anyway, today we're going to be talking about a very interesting part of Star Wars history that isn't really all that well covered by Star Wars, both in canon or in Legends. We're talking about the Empire's transition from using clone troopers to using stormtroopers. Let's start off by looking at Legends this time around by taking a look at one of my favorite novel series, the Republic Commando series. The Republic Commando series followed two groups of specialized clone troopers from the Battle of Geonosis through Order 66 to the rise of the New Order. Their experiences are not typical of your average clone trooper, but in the background of their story, we see a transition going on in the Empire. Order 66, ironically created by Palpatine himself, was a rude awakening at how easy it was to manipulate clones into doing your bidding. As we talked about in previous videos, had Palpatine been sipping a little too hard on that Sith juice and accidentally ordered Order 65 instead of Order 66, he could have accidentally deposed himself. Order 65, along with several other dictates in the contingency order of the Grand Army of the Republic, were focused on actually removing the Chancellor. And because the clone troopers were embedded with these chips in their heads and there was no easy way to remove the chips en masse, Order 65 and all the other orders that could have removed Palpatine from power were actually still active in all the clone troopers. And to make matter worse, the control of certain orders weren't even under Palpatine's command. Of course, no one besides Palpatine and his inner circle really knew about the contingency orders, but after Order 66 and the Jedi Purge, I don't think it would take that long for someone to figure it out. It would have been the ultimate weapon for individuals who were plotting against the Empire. Like the whiplash resistance cell on Coruscant led by Order 66 Jedi survivor Jax Pavin from the original Last Jedi novel. Order 65 and some of the other orders could actually be triggered by the Senate, and there are many unfriendly elements still in the Senate, including the delegation of 2000. Fortunately, they were pretty stupid, and they signed a petition asking Palpatine to return the emergency powers he had taken from them. This petition became a very useful list for the ISB to round up senators that were plotting against the Empire. But the fact that all these orders were still active in the clones' minds probably presented a true danger that Palpatine recognized. Another thing that was happening in Legends is the relationship between the Chancellor of the Republic and the Prime Minister of Kamino began worsening. Palpatine wanted to impose stricter security measures over the Kamino cloning facilities, using the Separatist invasion on the world as a motivator. What Palpatine wanted to really do was to prepare Kamino for a federal takeover once the rise of the New Order was completed. As we discussed in previous videos, the Empire's economic strategy was to nationalize as much of the military industrial complex as possible and bring it under control of the Empire to lower costs and increase production. Without the cloning process secure, the entire process would probably collapse. The Kaminoans, however, were arrogant and proud people. They had heavily modified and culled their own people in order to survive apocalyptic events on their own world. They saw all other species as inferior. Unfortunately for them, they were just basically talking fish aliens and not really superior to humans in any way. As I humanity first. They were also mostly dickheads and psychopaths that killed clones on the regular if they didn't fit their high standards. Of course, the clones produced from Kamino were amongst the best soldiers ever created, which is a testament to the skills of these fish heads, but they were just too expensive to train and it took way too long to train them, over nine years. The Republic couldn't replace clones fast enough, and the growing rift between the Chancellor and the Kaminoans led Palpatine to look at other alternatives. This is where Palpatine began creating his secret army. Although they were probably the best, the Kaminoans weren't the only cloners in the galaxy. Cloning was actually quite popular in the galaxy. It was a quick, cheap, and efficient way to create a giant labor force or a security force. This is why Palpatine approached Arcanian microtechnologies, kind of like the Kirkland brand of cloning, and asked them to build a secret facility on one of the moons of Coruscant. These new cloners set up Spartai cloning cylinders. Instead of taking nine years for a clone to fully mature and be trained as a soldier, the Spartai clones took only a year to make. This was done through a process called flash memory, where the brain was imprinted with knowledge. This process had some unwanted side effects like clone madness, which would cause them to go on rampages. 
This was especially bad if your clones were, say, in charge of a larger weapon, like a Star Destroyer or maybe even a Death Star. Palpatine also allocated a lot of secret funds in order to create weapons, armor, and vehicles for this new clone army. This new group of Sparta clones were first deployed during the Battle of Coruscant, where they were able to surprise and turn the tide against the Separatist Alliance attack. The Sparta clones were gradually introduced into normal clone units, and very quickly the original Kaminoan clones started noticing that these new clones were kind of strange. Frankly speaking, they were very dumb and clumsy and lacked any tactical awareness. They were basically organic forms of a B-1 battle droid. But that didn't really bother Palpatine. After all, he had created the Separatist Alliance in the first place and could destroy them as quickly as he made them. He didn't need superior soldiers, he just needed a lot of loyal ones so he could carry out Order 66. Now, after the Jedi Purge and the rise of the New Order, the clone troopers would be quickly rolled into the Stormtrooper Corps. Specialist clones like Commandos now became Imperial Commandos and were issued new weapons and new gear shortly after. The first missions that the Imperial Commandos were sent on were to hunt down rogue Jedi that they had originally served with and served under even. Towards the latter years of the war, there had been growing tension between Jedi Generals and their clone troopers. The Jedi, for the most part, remained emotionally unattached to their men and heavily focused on the mission, while the clones were starting to realize just how terrible their situation was and how little their leaders, including the Jedi, cared about them. So for many of the Republic Commandos and clone troopers, hunting down Jedi wasn't necessarily a bad thing. Although for some, the dissolution of the Republic seemed wrong somehow. They had been bred to protect the Republic, not this new empire. Other clones were extremely happy that they were able to kill their ex-generals. And their biggest worries after the war was that they would become reduced to police officers and have no more wars to fight. Eventually, the clone troopers would be outfitted with Stormtrooper armor and Stormtrooper weapons and officially become the Stormtrooper Corps. A group of rogue former Republic Commando clones would defect from the Empire. Their goal was to become free men. Many of the original FET clones had become tired of their service and was encouraged by their Mandalorian trainers to adopt the Mandalorian culture and way of life. And that Mandalorian culture led them to escape to Mandalore where they would go search for a cure for their advanced aging. With the rise of the New Order, Emperor Palpatine quickly moved to take over the cloning facilities on Kamino. The Kaminoans resented the military occupation of their world and launched their own rebellion using specially bred clones to fight the Emperor's new clone stormtroopers. Despite their valiant attempt, the Empire ended up defeating the uprising with the help of Boba Fett. The Kaminoan uprising shook the Imperial Army to the core. The Emperor realized that having one genetic template for all of his clones made his army vulnerable. This is why he started testing different genetic templates. The Empire also began recruiting civilians, especially from the Outer Rim territories, to fill in the Stormtrooper ranks. Slowly, the FET clones began being outnumbered in their own units that used to be made up of all FET clones. Many of these clones became bitter and resented the non-FET clones, who they rightly saw as inferior soldiers. Now, in canon, we have a shorter and less clear story of what happened. Unlike in Legends, there were no alternative cloning programs, there was just the one on Kamino. Despite being stretched thin across the galaxy, the clone troopers continued to bravely fight the overwhelming forces of the Separatists. But for some reason, some of the clones began acting strangely on the battlefield. One clone called Tup even shot a Jedi general in the middle of a battle. An arc trooper named Fives eventually figures out that the clones had a control chip inserted in all of their brains, and Tup's had malfunctioned prematurely, triggering Order 66. Fortunately, Palpatine was able to move quickly enough to contain this information from being widely spread. While some clones were able to figure out the inhibitor chips and even remove them, these were usually individual actions. There was no wider movement or even knowledge of these inhibitor chips. The ones that did find out were generally dismayed and their trust in the Republic was ruined. Besides Fines, we know that Captain Rex, Commando Gregor, and Commander Wolf were all able to remove their chips and escape the Empire. When Order 66 was carried out, all the clones obeyed their orders. But shortly after, some of them felt disturbed and even sick by their own actions. They had felt their bodies go into a trance-like mode when they turned on their Jedi commanders. Some clone troopers, like Grey, atoned for his actions by sacrificing himself to save a Jedi Padawan known as Caleb Doom. After the rise of the New Order, the clone troopers were enrolled into the Stormtrooper program. For some reason, the Empire closed down the Kamino cloning center. Perhaps it was because of the faulty control chips in their heads, or maybe it was more practical and cheaper to just recruit regular civilians that were grown by regular families without any funding from the Galactic Empire. Some clones were tasked with inventorying and packing up old Jedi relics, while others were once again sent to the front lines to crack down on Separatist holdouts and Jedi renegades. In canon, for some reason, age acceleration hits the clones a lot heavier than they do in Legends. 
Clones generally aged twice as fast as humans, which meant at nine years old, they were around 18 years old. But by four years before the Battle of Yavin, most of the clones were around 24 to 27 years old, which translate to 48 to 54 years old. Most of the clones by this time had died off or were replaced by regular civilian soldiers. But some of the toughest and most skilled clone troopers still served in the Empire. During the events of A New Hope, one clone sergeant was a part of the search team on Tatooine. Another clone trooper was the captain of the Emperor's Royal Guard, when Palpatine and Darth Vader's Star Destroyer was shot down over Ryloth by Cham Sandula's insurgents. So from this we can tell most likely Palpatine still trusted the clones enough to protect them, but most of them were just too old to serve anymore. Which means that like the TIE Fighter and many other things in the Empire, Palpatine probably ended the Superior Clone Program because it was simply too expensive to maintain and unnecessary, especially during the relatively peaceful times after the end of the Clone Wars. The Clone Trooper's legacy would continue on even after the last clone died. The architect of the First Order Stormtrooper program had served in the Grand Army of the Republic and had admired the skill and loyalty of the Clone Troopers and their Jedi Generals. He tried to instill the same type of qualities in his Stormtroopers by training them from birth. But after the Trooper Finn defected during the events of The Force Awakens, Kylo Ren commented that perhaps clones would be a better alternative to stormtroopers. In Legends, different Imperial factions that followed the Empire would utilize cloning technology to fill out their ranks because of how effective these individuals were in combat. Well guys, that's our video about how clone troopers evolved into stormtroopers, uh, the Legends and Canon version. Let me know in the comment section below which one you liked better. And also I do have to say I would love to see Disney revisit this time period and further flesh out what I think is one of the most interesting times in the Star Wars galaxy. Well guys, don't forget to subscribe and uh, hit that notification button. Also, if you are interested in the job, check us out on Facebook. Thanks for joining us today. If you're watching this, you are Generation Tech.